energy and water. I've got like 60 slides, which for me should take like 40 minutes. Did I go really quickly? And I don't know how to slow down. I'll try to slow down, but maybe I don't. So I'll go quickly. But a lot of times, you know, I have to ask me whatever you want about energy, or water, or whatever. And I'm really pleased to be here today. It's my first time on the Carroll campus. And pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet the, the high school students who are here that we had dinner with earlier. And happy to share with you some of my thoughts on energy and water. And just to put it in sort of background context, energy and water are interrelated. It's one of the main points I want you to walk away with that energy and water are connected. We use energy for water, we use water for energy. And in fact, this relationship has some good things, and it's a bad thing from a quantitative perspective. If you look at the quantitative respect, uh, perspective of energy and water, there's good news and bad news. If we have sufficiently abundant, clean, and affordable energy, our water problems are solved. If we have all the energy we need, we can pump water from a, away from a mountain, we can heat salt the oceans, we can dig deep wells. If we had infinite energy, we could have our water problems solved. And actually, the other way around is true also. We have infinitely clean, abundant water, all our energy problems we solve, we can grow our way out of the problem. Biofuels, or we can build dams and hydroelectric systems and generate all the electricity we need. So there's a quantitative relationship that's quite good, but there's also a quantitative relationship that's bad, which is if we don't have enough of each, we might have a shortage of the other. So you get coupled failures or cascading vulnerabilities where a water constraint becomes an energy constraint and an energy constraint becomes a water constraint. So this is the bad news of the energy water relationship, at least from the quantities. There's also a qualitative part of this, a quality aspect to this, where energy affects water quality in good ways and bad ways. Energy makes water quality better. We spend energy to make our water clean, for example, except that energy also can make water quality bad from pollution, like chemical pollution or thermal pollution radiation from water. And water affects the quality of energy, good and bad. So we can use water to improve the efficiency of power plants through cooling. If you cool a power plant, it gets better efficiency. It gives you more power out. And we can also use water to improve recovery from oil and gas production. Things like hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Hydraulic means water, using water to get more oil and gas out of the ground. So it improves the amount of energy we get. Except that if you don't have the water, you get worse performance at the power plant or heat waves, or you can have a problem with the water you need to produce. So they are good for each other's quality, they're bad for each other's quality, they're good for each other's quantity, and they're bad for each other's quantity, depending on how you look at it. And that's the big picture of energy and water. Now, if we look at just how we use water for energy, we use water in a variety of ways. We use water to, to drive hydroelectric turbines and dams. We use water to drive steam turbines and power plants. In fact, steam turbines make up about 72% of our power plants in America. Most of our power plants are driven by steam. That steam is a form of water. Then we use another form of water, cooling water, to condense that steam back out to make the power plants work. So we use water for the power sector. We use water for fuels production, for things like growing biofuels, for extracting oil and gas, for mining coal, uranium, like for washing the coal, that kind of thing. And for refining and bringing fuels, we often use steam from water to improve the fuels. And then we use water to transport those fuels. So we use water for energy in you know, a lot of ways. If we look just at the power sector, the thermoelectric power sector, that's the part of the power sector that uses heat to make electricity, which is most of the power sector, things like nuclear, coal, gas, oil, that kind of thing, biomass. It is the single largest cause of water withdrawal in every day in America. So about 48% of all the water that we take out of the ground, lakes, and rivers every day is taken out of the ground, lakes, and rivers to cool power plants. A lot of people are That's the number one cause of water use every day in America. And 39% of the total fresh water withdrawal. Some of the power plants are on the coast that use all water. We use ocean water. So that's non-consumptive use. We take the water out of the ground, we cool the power plants, we turn the water to the lake or wherever it was. It is something like one to 40 gallons of water per kilowatt hour of electricity. So over the course of this talk, which will be about three hours long, over the course of this talk, this room, the heating, the light bulb, the projector, the computer, all of you who aren't really listening, but take notes of the computer, there's several kilowatts and hours of electricity you consumed in this room over the course of the talk. Depending on how you got your power, that might cause a couple hundred gallons of water to withdraw somewhere else. That's a non-consumptive use. A fraction of that water that's used for power plants that's actually consumed or evaporated. That's something like a, a 0.1 gallons to 0.2 gallons, depending on the type of power plant you use. So a large amount of water is used for power plant, a small part of that's evaporated, the rest of the return where it came from. And the amount of water used varies by the type of fuel or power cycle, the natural gas, coal, or whatever you use, fine type of gas, that kind of thing. So what kind of cooling technology and cooling power or not, that affects how much water is used. We use a lot of water for power. We also use a lot of water or shale production. And this is sort of an obvious story, it just makes a story, in fact, since it's a story in North Dakota. It's a, it's a big story for a lot of reasons. One of the main reasons is that there are 11 environmental risks that I can identify from hydraulic fracture. There's the land disturbance that's bad, number one, the fresh water use, using millions of gallons of fresh water, you throw it through the aquifer, you're fracturing at the bottom. By the way, this is not the scale. This might be 5,000 feet here. 
um, down to 55,000 feet over. So the derrick is not really 8,000 feet tall, but the, uh, the truck is not 1,000 feet tall, so it's not a scale. But this uh, shows that there's a risk here of fracturing. You have wastewater store on a pit. So you pull up for the pit, you might truck it off, then you might treat it, or we start treatment plant, you might jack it back in the ground, then you have firing and lost gases. There's 11 environmental impacts. Many of those are water related. And that's one of the reasons why we care about water pressure. But just the fracking itself, that's a completion process. Some people think fracking is a type of drilling. There's drilling, then fracking. You can drill the well, then you complete the well, complete the well, but fracking is how it's That's one of the ways to go about it. The term fracking was an industry shorthand, by the way. The industry would call it fracking. And now, people who don't like fracking have adopted the term fracking because it sounds like a pejorative, so to speak. So it's like fracking, finance, that kind of thing. So uh, now, the industry is not like word fracking because environmentalists have adopted it as an anti production effort. But I use the word fracking. And there are frac fluids, fluids that are used in hydraulic fracking that are injected into the well. And that's something like two to nine billion gallons of frac fluids per well. Most of that's water. There's also like a half million pounds of sand, which is like profits. That sand cracks, the uh, water cracks the shell, and the sand helps hold it open so the, the gas and the liquids flow back out. And then you also have some chemicals in there. And the trick with the chemicals is that it's about 2%. This is a real sensitive point for people because you're injecting nasty stuff into the ground, and then there's actually already nasty stuff in the ground that comes back up. That fraction used to be half a percent, and now it's 2% chemical. The ratio of chemicals is on the rise for a couple of reasons. One is the amount of water that's being used is on the decline because water is expensive and it's really dangerous people when you use all the water or totally to be fracking. So companies are looking for you to use less water. One way to use less water is to use more chemicals. So this is an interesting environmental trade-off. If you're an environmentalist, do you want them to use less water or less chemicals or both? Or how do you do that? So it's a challenge. And as you move to liquid rich shales, shale gave uh, liquids and gases. As we move towards liquids rich shales, and shale gave us more liquids that are worth more because you can sell it at prices for oil as opposed to prices for gas. Those liquids rich shales use more acids and gels and things like that. So you have to worry about all the fluids you're putting in. You have to worry about things like induced seismicity, which is a flying word for causing earthquakes or may cause earthquakes. And you have to worry about seepage or stuff seeping up from the fractures through natural fissures and stuff to the groundwater. Now, generally, I think the concerns about fracking are overblown. There's not really that many concerns with fracking. Now, there are concerns with how about fracturing the process, but it's not with the fracking itself. It's with the wastewater that comes back up to the surface. It's with the leaks of the natural gas. It's with the trucks. There's a lot of problems with fracking. But the fracking does. <coughs> Thousands of people below the aquifer, thousands of feet away from the, the drilling pad, it's not that big a deal. So, at least in my sense, it seems like there are very few actual instances of problem there. No. The problems are real, they're just by other problems. We'll cover that. If you look at this across the nation, that two to nine million gallons is a lot for each well, but across the nation, that's actually not that big a deal on average. It's like a, a few percent of national water use is for oil and gas extraction, less than one percent of oil and gas, and then other industrial uses and other things. <coughs> that includes the refining and chemical factories and that kind of thing. So a few percent of national water for all for fracking and for all oil and gas production in general, well, it's not really a big deal, it seems like, at least on average. But in your local county or neighborhood, it might be 25% of the local water. So locally, it's a, it could be very big, especially if you're in an area that's arid, like in Texas. Pennsylvania has a lot of water from Texas, so you're more worried in general about water quality than you have quantity, although the quantities are not critical. So this is sort of an issue uh, at a local scale. And in some of those watersheds, we have shell production and you have natural gas plants and you have chemical plants. You need additional water use in the same watershed in a place that might be a desert, say, like South San Antonio, Texas. If you look at this shale map, this is a map of the shales in America. Here's the Barnett Shale. This is a, near Dallas and Fort Worth. This is where the shell revolution plays took off. And a man named George Mitchell, who tried for decades to get the gas out of shale, probably made it work out. They combined that hydraulic fracturing with horizontal drilling, going sideways to get an economic production gas. And you have a big boom in the Eagle Bird, South San Antonio, the Permian Basin, of West Texas, the Pocket, North Dakota, the Marcella Shale, out here is a big deal. But look, there's many other shales actually all over the United States. In fact, there's shales all over the world. But the shale revolution is still in U.S. phenomenon so far. Poland, South Africa, China all have shale that has not happened yet. But they probably will within 10 or 20 years as the technology get better and as we export. One of the challenges. Those areas of shale overlap with droughts. So this is a problem that much so related. This is a drought area. Here's a drought area. Not so bad the Bakken, but they're really straight into the Missouri River. You guys are following. Does that make you feel better? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright, so this is the challenge. Some of these areas are also written. If you look at it overall, 
despite the water use for shale, from it's actually not that water sensitive on its life cycle overall. If you compare conventional oil uh, to unconventional, so conventional oil is something like one to five gallons of water per gallon of oil. In unconventional oil, or something like five to ten gallons of water per gallon of fuel, and the same thing for, for the gases. Um, it's getting more water intensive as we go to the unconventional sources, meaning the sources that aren't liquid, like our sands or oil shale, that kind of thing. The biofuels are much more water intensive. Corn is 500 to 2,000 gallons of water per gallon of fuel. Algae is even worse from water perspective. Although with algae, you can use wastewater or salt water, so you don't care if you use the water. On an energetic basis, shale gas gets up by 2 to 8 gallons of water per million BTU of energy. If BTU is that British thermal unit, it's a unit of energy in the MM. It's a weird arcane notation scheme from the energy industry. M is the Roman numeral for 1,000. And M times M is 1,000 times 1,000 to 2 million. So M is really just crazy. Right? No one would ever really design a notation scheme that way except for the energy industry. You know, you need 2 to 8 gallons of water per million BTU of energy. And one BTU is about the energy content of a kitchen match. In one of these, like a couple thousand gallons of water per million BTU. So natural gas from shale is water intensive because it's moving down all at once in your backyard, in your church parking lot, in your neighborhood. It's locally used a lot, but on average, it's a big deal compared to some other options. Maybe not such a big deal. It doesn't mean uh, we shouldn't care, but just put it in context. And then if you look across its entire life cycle, I mean, not just the water for production, but how the water will be used for subsequent uses of the energy, it, it gives a different picture. This is a, a picture of water used for power in Texas for electricity with a conventional coal plant here. So here's the y axis This is water consumption in gallons per kilowatt hour of electricity. It's 0.62 gallons, like almost a gallon of water is consumed per kilowatt hour of electricity from a coal plant in Texas. And this green part is the water that's consumed for cooling the power plant. Most of the water uses for cooling the power plant. There's also some for fuel production here, like yellow, uh, and also for emissions control. So you just inject water in the stack of scrub and then stack of pollutions. And so that's where you use the water for a coal plant. Where if you use natural gas and the natural gas combined cycle times, which is newer and more efficient, you save half that water just from having a more efficient power plant. And then you have a natural gas combined cycle plant that's partially air cooled, so you save some water cooling. You get an increase here, so you have an increase in water fracking. So fracking is more water intensive than coal production. You can see the bump up there. But you have such big drops from efficiency in air cooling that another drop for avoided emissions control. So natural gas doesn't need emissions control the way coal does. You end up getting 0.25 gallons per kilowatt hour. This is a pretty interesting trade off because we're using more water to produce the fuel than coal, but then we're saving some of the water elsewhere so that on a life cycle it is an advantage from the water climate perspective. Now, the trick here is the place where the additional water is used is not the place where the water is saved. So, one river basin has additional water used from injection, hydraulic fracturing, uh, frac the fracturing or fracking. Another river basin is where the, the water is avoided from fueling. So it's different people see the water use go up and down, and there's a time lag of like six months from the water trajectory to when the power plant will use it. So there's, on average, across the national scale, across the state scale, or scale of water savings are locally and micro level. The water use for energy also produces concerns about water quality. You have to worry about chemicals and slurry spills from coal. You have to worry about uh, radiation contamination from nuclear and Fukushima and the radiated water coming across the Pacific Ocean towards California. You have to worry about mining tails from extractive industry like coal mining. You have to worry about thermal pollution, change in temperature of the water, thermal pollution in the form of heat from power plants. When you bring the water into your power plant, you can cool that power plant, you're heating up the water, you return the hot water to the river, and you're elevating the temperature that's a form of thermal pollution that affects the ecosystem. Or if you have a dam, if they have a dam, you have a pen stock, a water posted dam, it actually gets colder on the other side of the dam, so that's another form of thermal pollution. And then of course, if we're about oil spills, plastic, and water pollution, and chemical injection, and hydraulic fracturing. Most of the forms of energy we have have chemical impacts or thermal impacts that we can be aware of. Wind and solar PV tend to be lower impact on water, although there's a water impact from the mining of the shell we used to do. But at the point of production, they would be water for cooling, maybe a little water for washing, but that's about it. So you talk about water quality. We get all the water that you, you take into the frack well or take out of the extra truck around. You see these truck around. There aren't really that many pipes to move around. And these trucks are a real problem. These trucks are moving in millions of gallons of truck pollution, moving out millions of gallons of wastewater. And they are noisy, they have air pollution, they dust, they cause traffic congestion, they damage the roads, which is costing local counties. There are some studies showing that if your county has a boom in all the gas production, it will be poorer at the end of it because its cost for hospitals and roads go up. And the tax revenue goes to the state, not to the county in many cases. So in Texas, we have counties that are seeing a boom, but they're not getting richer, they're getting poorer because of service needs 
have to go up, and the money went to the state of Texas, so you know, that's a challenge. And then real risk of accidents, property damage, death, uh, which is overwhelming with the hospitals in Texas. There's some cities where they don't have enough beds for all the men who are hurt from the rigs or from the, the driving. And you have to worry about water contamination from the spills. This is the water risk. When these trucks carry nasty stuff in an accident, they spill chemicals. This is where your real water risk is. It's not really in the tracking, it's at the surface where it could trickle down into the water. The other problem is the wastewater. You put millions of gallons in, you get millions of gallons back. The amount of wastewater you get back actually varies based on where you are. In the Marcellus, you get like 15% back. In the Eagleford, you get like 30% back. You know, the Barnett, here at Dallas, or you get 300% back. You put in 2 million gallons, you get 6 million gallons back. You have to deal with it. And it's nasty stuff, comprised of throwing muds and throwing that water, which the water you put in it comes right back into the produced water, which comes up over time with the well. And this nasty stuff, it's got what's called norm there. Norm is naturally occurring radioactive materials. It's got arsenic, it's got all sorts of nasty stuff out there, plus whatever you put in. So there's a lot of chemicals you wouldn't want to drink this is far beyond what you would drink without extensive treatment. And it's often stored on site in ponds or pits. You have to worry about that because if you store it in a pond or pit, you can leak down into the groundwater. You can line your pits and the pits. And in fact, there are examples. There's one in Pennsylvania, so they got they didn't line the pit, or they lined the pit to treat them badly. If they lined the pit, they threw some equipment, they got hose into the pit, and the equipment just tore over lining and then the chemicals trickled out. So this is a risk point for hydraulic pressure. And then if you take that nasty water to a wastewater treatment plant and treat it, that treatment plant might not be able to actually treat the water to a clean up standard, but it will pass it through and put it in the river anyway. So then that treatment plant is actually polluting the river, which is a big no no. So there are uh, companies that are fine in Pennsylvania that are doing that. They're saying, yeah, we'll take the water, pay us money, we'll take the water. They took it, they tried to treat it, put it in the river, and it wouldn't work out. So that's another challenge. And then you can also do wastewater disposal. Now, wastewater disposal is considered by many people to be the economically and environmentally sensible option. It gets this nasty water, puts it out of, uh, out of risk for the fresh water contamination, you don't study energy or treat it, that kind of thing. But not every place has opportunity for wastewater injection. Texas has wastewater injection sites. There's only like 150,000 wastewater injection wells across the entire nation. 50,000 of them are in Texas. So Texas has really good geology and regulations and markets for injecting wastewater back in the ground. There are 50,000 as well in Texas. There's like seven in Pennsylvania. Only 7,000, seven. And so you don't have sites in Pennsylvania because the geology's not there, the market's not there, the regulations aren't there. So you can't really inject the wastewater in Pennsylvania. So for a while, because Ohio will make some people who take wastewater to Ohio inject it there, and some people injected it at a, a hole in Youngstown called the Youngstown uh, earthquake. So Ohio was really pissed off. They said, wait a second, they get all the jobs and money to get earthquakes. No deal, right? <laughs> so I believe Ohio never has a ban. You cannot do wastewater injection for any water that was not sourced in Ohio. You can't bring water into other states to inject it in the ground. And the risk there is that if you inject that fault, if you're putting a lot of water or high pressure, you're actually lubricating the fault and lose the fault probably. But there are lots of earthquakes happening right now in North Texas, Oklahoma. A, a flurry of earthquakes that travel away gas pumps. Now, it could be, we think it's from the wastewater injection. It also could be, you pump so much oil and gas out of the ground, the ground is out of 